Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, Today insha'Allah I will solve with you some uh, problems on different topics of chemistry This is the first one in chemistry so let's choose some random questions on some topics For example a metal plate has a circular hole in it as shown in this figure below As the plate is heated what would happen to the size of the hole? So when you heat up any metal the atoms start to move away from each other because of the collision and the higher kinetic energy so we would expect the size of everything to increase including the hole so the hole size will increase so I will choose this one the graph below represents the heating curve of a substance so this is a relation between the temperature and time or the amount of heat given to the material what is the boiling point of this substance when you look at the heating curve you need to notice the different parts of the curve at the beginning the, the substance is solid okay so you heat it up you increase its kinetic energy so in this part let's call it part A you increase its kinetic energy that means you increase its temperature until you reach what we call melting point so the temperature here is called melting point then you need to overcome the potential energy which is the attraction forces between the atoms or the molecules of this solid so during the second part I will call it part B there is no increase in kinetic energy there is no increase in temperature but you will give the energy to overcome this potential energy and during this period the solid changes into liquid so in the next part which is C the liquid will start to take the energy to increase its kinetic energy so we expect the temperature to increase until you reach to this point at this point we call it the boiling point this is the temperature at which the substance or the liquid will boil then it needs another amount of energy let's call this area D so this amount of energy during this area or this period is to overcome the potential energy between the atoms or the molecules of the liquid but during the period D there is no change in kinetic energy and there is no change in temperature so once you change all the liquid into vapor or into gas then if you heat it up again you would increase the kinetic energy and the temperature of the gas itself so in this question what is the boiling point the boiling point is 80 while the melting point is 20 which of the following statements is true when water freezes its density its density decreases so let's discuss this issue for any substance if you cool it down its density will increase except water when you cool it down below the four degrees Celsius the volume of the water because of the crystal formation the volume will expand the volume will increase meaning that the density of the water will decrease so below four degrees Celsius the density of the water will decrease while its volume will increase so I will choose this one let's discuss the other parts of this question too in amorphous solids like glass the particles have a specific geometrical arrangement of course not because this is only for the crystalline solids while the amorphous solids they have random shapes in the order of the atoms and molecules uh, number C most of ordinary matter in the universe the universe is in liquid state of course not because most of the uh, matter in the stars it's in plasma state number D condensation is a change of state from liquid to gas no condensation is change from gas to liquid gas into liquid 
while the vaporization is the change from liquid into gas. The melting point of benzene is 5.5 degrees Celsius and its boiling point is 80.1 degrees Celsius. At what temperature will both solid and liquid be present? For liquid and solid to be present, this is at the melting point. And for the liquid and gas to be present, this is at the boiling point. So here for the solid and liquid, we will choose the melting point, which is 5.5. When pure water boils, you can see bubbles rising to the surface of the water. Of what are these bubbles made? These bubbles are made of water vapor, okay? Because uh, the water reaches to its boiling point and it turns into gas, which is the water vapor here, and it's in the shape of bubbles, so water vapor. Let's see this curve. At which portion uh, on the graph below is the average kinetic energy of the water molecules increasing? So when he says average kinetic energy, so he means the temperature. So at which part the temperature increases? So if you look here at this graph, at F, this is an increase in temperature, and during H, this is an increase in temperature, so I would choose F and H. Which of the following expands most when the temperature is lowered? We know that when the temperature, temperature is lowered, the object contracts, except in water below 4 degrees Celsius, it expands. So I would choose water below the 4 degrees Celsius, it starts to expand. Of course, iron, if you lower its temperature, it will contract. This, the helium is the same. Okay, so only the water does that. Which of the following changes of state releases thermal energy? To release thermal energy, you need to go either from gas into liquid, which is the condensation, or from the liquid into solid, which is the freezing. In those two cases, the thermal energy is released. So I would say the condensation. Because melting, melting needs energy, vaporization needs energy, sublimation needs energy. Which of the following changes of state can be identified as only evaporation? So evaporation is the change from liquid into gas, but under the temperature of the boiling. A shallow pond, a shallow pond dries up in the summer. At 100 degrees Celsius, the water in a pan changes to a steam. 100 degrees Celsius, this is the boiling point. This is the boiling point, so that's vaporization, not evaporation. Dry ice in an ice cream car disappears. No, because dry ice, that's sublimation. This one is sublimation. Snow on the ground turns to liquid water. So that's melting. No. So the first one, the shallow pond dries up. It dries up because water evaporates below the 100 degrees Celsius, which is in the normal weather. It happens in the summer, so that's evaporation. So I will choose this one. A student continuously heated one kilogram of ice until it turned to steam. And graph the changes in temperature over time as in the figure below. How would this graph differ if only 0.5 kilogram of ice were being heated? There will be no change in the temperature. Temperature is the same, but time or some time is, they call it the heat given to the system. The heat will be half of the heat required for the one kilogram. So I would choose the time of heating will be half. Okay, so we will need half of the time required for the full one kilogram. What do boiling and evaporation have in common? Boiling and evaporation. Let's see. Occur at specific boiling point, no. Bubbles, no. There is no bubbles in the evaporation. Bubbles is only in the boiling. Change of state. Of course, there is a change of state here, but from liquid into gas. Here he says 
the change of state from gas to liquid no so I will choose none of them none of them which is unlikely contain plasma cloud does not contain plasma stars it contains plasma the lightning bolt the lightning it contains plasma which is arc okay arc plasma or plasma arc uh, neon light of course it contains plasma so all of these have plasma except the clouds density of water below the four degrees we, we know that the below the four degrees Celsius the volume will increase and density I will call it row density will decrease so decreases as you call water below four degrees Celsius increases of course not is always constant not has highest value at zero no it's not right the highest value of the density the highest value of the density is at four degrees Celsius this is the highest value of the density let's move to something else the buoyant force to remember the buoyant force the buoyant force if you have some liquid let's say it's water and you put some object let's say there are two cases here the object might float and it might sink down like if you have a piece of wood it might float and if you have a piece of iron it will sink down so what's the difference in between the buoyant force here and there the buoyant force is a force pushing the objects upward the buoyant force equals the density of the liquid density of the liquid which is water in this case times the volume of the displaced water times gravity so what's the volume of the displaced water it's the volume of the liquid which is displaced by the object itself which uh, in the case of sinking equals the, the volume of the object and in case of floating equals only submerged part of the object which is this part so this is the buoyant force rho of the liquid which is here water volume of the displaced part and G is 9.8 as we know in both cases there is weight which is downward that's the weight of the object and that's the weight of the object in this cases in the case of floating the buoyant force equals the weight of the object because it's in equilibrium while in the case of sinking you cannot say that but you need to apply Newton's second law the weight minus the buoyant force equals mass times acceleration because there is no equilibrium in this case and there is acceleration which is downward so most of the problems are about floating so take care that during floating the weight of the object equals to the buoyant force and the buoyant force in all cases equals uh, rho of the liquid times the volume of the displaced water times gravity and again the volume of the displaced part equal to the volume of the object if it is sinking and only the submerged part of the object if it is floating so let's go back to our problems a block of iron sinks in a lake while a block of wood of the same size so they have the same size floats as shown in this figure below which of the following statements about the buoyant force let's calculate the buoyant force for both of them buoyant force here and buoyant force we said buoyant force is rho times g times v rho of the water so both they are emerged in water so rho is the same for both of them gravity gravity is the same for both of them but what about the displaced volume here what about the volume which is displaced in both cases in the first case in the one which is totally submerged inside the water the volume of the displaced water equals the total volume of the object while in the one which is floating only part of the volume so only this part is the submerged under the water so the buoyant force of the one that sink down is greater than the buoyant force of the one that is floating so the buoyant force of the iron which is this one 
is greater than the buoyant force on the wood block. An object suspended from a spring scale is lowered into a pail filled to the brim with water. So there is a, a pail filled to the top or to the end with water. And a four newton of water overflows. So when you put this object inside, you hang it by a scale. Okay, so some water overflows, some water will overflow. Okay, what is the volume of the water that will overflow? It equals to the volume that's submerged inside the water. So the volume of the water equals to the volume of the object. The scale shows that the object weighs 6 newton in water. So the scale reading is the tension here. And there is other there are other forces acting on the object. There is the weight of the object and there is a buoyant force which is upward. So the three forces are balanced. So we can say T which is the tension, which is the reading of the scale, plus the buoyant force equals the weight of the object. So the reading equals the weight minus the buoyant force. So here the reading, it was 6 newton, 6 newton in the water. Uh, and he's asking now the weight of the object outside the water is what? So he gives us some hint here. There are four newton of water will overflow. Let's see the water that overflows here. We said the volume of this water equals to the volume of the object. What about the weight of this water? The weight of the overflow water. The weight of this overflow water is its mass times gravity. And we know the mass is the density times the volume. So it's rho V. G. Rho is the row of water. V is the volume of the overflow water which equals to the displaced water by the object. So this is the displaced water by the object times G. This buoyant force is rho times V displacement times G. So the buoyant force equals to the displaced water. So which is 4 Newton in this case. So this one is 4 Newton. So he's asking what is the weight of the object outside the water, the real weight of the object, which is W naught. So W naught, I can see it's T plus buoyant force, as we said before here, which is 6 plus 4 gives us 10 Newton. So the result is 10 Newton. A block suspended by weighing scale weights 5 newton out of water so this is the weight of the object which is w naught 5 newton outside the water when it is submerged into water the scale reads its weight as 3 newton so the reading of the scale which is the tension here is 3 newton how much buoyant force acts on the block as we said before if you have some liquid and you submerge something here which is hung which is hung by a scale we have some forces we have the weight of the object downward we have the tension which is the reading of the scale and we have the buoyant force upward so T plus buoyant force equals to the weight or the real weight of the object here he gives us the real weight 5 Newton and he says the scale reads 3 newton. So this is the tension, 3. So the buoyant force, I would say, equals 5 minus 3, which is 2 newton. So this is the buoyant force, 2 newton. Okay? A stone is thrown into deep lake. As it sinks deeper and deeper into the water, the buoyant force on it. So if we have a deep 
place like the lake or something and it's filled with liquid if something is submerged and it sinks down what's the buoyant force buoyant force as we said it's rho of the liquid which is water here times gravity which is g times the volume of the submerged part so the volume as long as it sinks down so the volume is constant so rho is constant g is constant volume is constant so the buoyant force is constant so it remains the same it does not increase it does not decrease okay a uh, beaker that is completely filled with water weighs 30 newton as in the figure below what would be the reading of the scale when 5 newton block of wood floats in it of course this uh, beaker is filled of water to the top okay so when you put some object like the 5 newton of wood some water will overflow and it spilled down okay so what is the volume and what's the weight of the spilled water this overflow water what's the weight of this water the weight is m times g and we know that mass is rho which is density times the volume of this water times the gravity so the weight of the spilled water the water that left this beaker is the row of water times the volume of the overflow water times g how much volume do we have here the volume of the spilled water equals the volume of the submerged part of the block which is the volume of the object under the level of the water or under the surface of the water so as we know the buoyant force the buoyant force equals rho of the liquid times the displaced volume times g so in this case the buoyant force equals the same weight of the water that is overflow so they are equal and we know like 10 minutes ago that if the object floats on water so there are two forces the weight of the object downward and the buoyant force upward so we can say also the weight of the object which is 5 newton in this case equals to the buoyant force so it equals to the buoyant force equals 5 newton and the buoyant force equal to the part of the water that is spilled so that means we lost some water the weight of this water is 5 newton and also you add a weight which is the block of wood which is also 5 newton so you lost 5 newton and you added 5 newton so there will be no change to the total weight of the water so it will give you the same reading which is 30 newton if 0.98 newton buoyant force acts on a wooden block while it's submerged in water what would be the mass of the displaced water? water here in a container and an object floats on this water of course we have the weight downward and the buoyant force upward and we know the buoyant force equals rho times g times v rho of the water g is 9.8 times the volume so this is the volume of the displaced part of the water the volume of the displaced part of the water of course rho times g is sorry rho times v rho times v equals the mass of the water or the displaced water the mass of the displaced water here times g gives you the buoyant force so the buoyant force here is 0.98 equals the mass of the displaced water times g which is 9.8 so the mass is 0.98 divided by 9.8 for the pressure pressure means force over area generally the force in newton and the area is square meter so that's in newton the unit is in newton over square meter newton over square meter we call it pascal so this is the SI unit of pressure it's Pascal or Newton over square meter 
So generally speaking, the pressure equals the force over area. So in this problem, when holding attack between your thumb and index fingers as shown in this figure below, which pressure is more? The pressure on your index or the pressure on your thumb or both are the same? At the beginning, from Newton's third law, there are two forces equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. One is on your thumb and the other is on your index finger. So what about the pressure? We said the pressure is force over area. So the force over area one, you see the head of this tick is smaller than the base of the tick. So we can conclude that when the area is small, in this case, the pressure will be high. So we expect the pressure, or we conclude the pressure on the index is higher than the pressure on the thumb. Pascal law, or Pascal principle. Pascal said that the pressure transfers an incompressible liquids, like oils, for example. So if we have a piston, let's say we have a cylinder here, it's filled of liquid, and it has two sides, and in each side we have a piston. This is a piston one, and this is piston two. One and two. As you see, the area of the piston two is greater than the area of piston one. So here, the pressure at this point equals the pressure on the other side. So the pressure equals force over area. So the pressure here or over the first piston, which is pressure, let's call it F1 divided by A1. So the force on this piston, if it is F1, so the pressure is F1 over A1. And on the other side, it's the same pressure. But here it's F2, if the force is F2, divided by A2. So we can say that F1 divided by A1 equals to F2 divided by A2. So this is Pascal principle. So as the force or as the, the, the area of the piston is small, the force also is small. And if the area is big, so the force also is big. Because it's a ratio between both of them while the pressure is constant. So let's look at this problem. A hydraulic lift is used to lift a heavy box that's pushing down on a five square meter piston with a force 2000 Newton. What force needs to be exerted on a 0.05 square meter piston to lift the box? So we have a simple hydraulic device. It has two sides. There is a piston on the first one. The force number one is 2000 Newton. The area of the piston is five square meter. On the other side, there is another piston, smaller one, with a force, let's call it A2, F2, and the area A2 is a smaller one, 0 0.05. So we expect that the force F2 is smaller because its area is smaller. As the two pressures are the same, that's Pascal principle. So, F1 divided by A1 equals F2 divided by A2. Let's substitute. F1 is 2000, A1 is 5, and A2 is 0.05. So what's F2? So F2 is essentially 20 Newton. So I would choose this one. Pascal's principle states that pressure applied to the fluid is transmitted through the fluid. This is Pascal principle. So the pressure is transmitted through the fluid as long as the fluid is incompressible, and most of the liquids are incompressible.
A car on a 25 square meter hydraulic lift platform weighs 15,000 newtons. So we have also a hydraulic system. The big area, which is 25 square meter, this is the area. And take care of something which is very important. Now he's giving us the area. Sometimes he gives you the radius, only the radius of the piston. If he gives you the radius of the piston, so you need to get the area from the equation. The area equals pi r square. So take care, that's very, very important. If he gives you the area, so that's fine. You can use it directly. But if he gives you the radius of this piston or the diameter of the piston, you need to get the area from this equation uh, pi, which is 3.14 times r square. So we need to take care of this one. So again, the area is 25 square meter, and the force, which is the weight of the car, is 15,000 newton. If the force on the smaller piston requires to lift the car is 1 over 100 of, of its weight. So the force here is 1 over 100 of its weight, which is 15,000 over 100. That's 150 Newton. What is the area of the smaller piston? It should be the same ratio. You need to divide also the area over 100. Or you can use the ratio force over area. So 15,000 over the area, which is 25 gives you the other force which is 150 divided by the first area so i would say the first area equals 0.25 square meter okay next is bernoulli principle bernoulli principle he worked on the dynamic flow of the liquids in tubes for example he says like if there is a flow of a liquid so there is a, a, a relation between the area of the tube and the velocity of the liquid the flow rate the flow rate of the liquid is constant if you uh, enter let's say one liter per second from this side so i expect also one liter per second from the other side because it's the same tube so if one liter per second enters from the left hand side it should be output from the right hand side the flow rate is area times velocity so the area 1 times velocity 1 of the lift fluid equals area 2 times velocity 2 of the fluid so that's called continuity equation so that's the first part if you restrict if you try to restrict the flow of the liquid its velocity increases Okay, like what happens in the hose when you press with your finger on the hose the speed of the fluid or the speed of the water increases so it reaches higher distances so let's go to this problem again which uses Bernoulli's principle hose end sprayer like when you try to restrict the water with the end when you press on the end of the hose Okay, the water sprays and its speed increases. So that one is Bernoulli's principle. Piston, piston, of course, it's Pascal uh, principle. Skateboard, of course not, and buoyancy is Archimedes, if you remember this. So again in this tube, if this is a tube, if the area increased, the velocity decreased. And if the area decrease the velocity will increase what about the pressure also the pressure and the velocity they are opposite to each other if the velocity increases the pressure inside the tube will decrease like in this case if this velocity is very low so i expect the pressure to be high and on the other side if the velocity increased if the velocity here is high so i expect the pressure in this area to be small pressure okay so let's see some problems that might include the pressure as well. Let's see this one. <clears throat> a liquid with negligible viscosity flows through a pipe shown in this figure. This is an overhead view. So it's like a horizontal pipe. 
At what point the pressure of the liquid is highest? We know that the pressure is high when the velocity is low. And we know that the velocity is low when the cross section area, when the area is high. So let's see, he is asking about the highest pressure. The highest pressure means lowest speed or highest cross sectional area. Where is the highest cross sectional area? It's at 0.4. This is the highest cross-sectional area, so I would choose, choose number 4. Rank in order from highest to lowest the liquid heights H1 to H4. What's the relation between the pressure, the pressure at each part, and the height of the liquid? Of course, is the, if the pressure is high, it will push the liquid down. So, if the pressure is high, the height will decrease. So the relation between the pressure and the height is inverse proportionality. If the pressure increases, it will push the liquid down, so the height will decrease. So this is the first one. What about the relation between the pressure and the cross-sectional area of the tube and the velocity? We know that if the area increases, if the area increases, sorry, the area increases, the velocity will decrease and the pressure will increase. Okay, so we can say like roughly relation, the relation between area and pressure, they increase together or they decrease together in this case. So the higher the area, the higher the pressure, the lower the height. So we can say directly area and height are inversely proportional. So, the higher the area or the bigger the area, the smaller the height or the lower the height. So, let's see where is the biggest area. The biggest area actually is the space because this is like the, there is no constraint here. So, I would say this one has the highest area means the H will be the smaller. So, H1 is the smaller. H1 is the smaller. Where is the smallest area? The smallest area is here at H2. So I would say H2 is the bigger one. So H2 is the higher one because this is the lowest pressure. Then at H4, that's next one. And then H3, this is the next one. And where there is no constraint here, I would say like the area is very, very, very large. So the H will be very, very small. So that's how we order them. Something similar here, gas flows through a pipe as shown in the figure below. The pipe's constant outer diameter is shown, but you cannot see it, see into the pipe to know how inner diameter changes. Rank in order from largest to smallest. The gas speeds V1, V2, V3. So we need to find the gas speeds. We said before, if the height is low, that means the pressure is high. So pressure number three is the highest pressure. Then pressure number one. So let's rank the pressure first. Pressure three is higher than pressure number one, higher than the pressure number two. What's the relation between pressure and the speed? Pressure and the speed, they are inversely proportional. Again, the, 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 the relation is not very easy like this one, but roughly they are inversely proportional to each other. So I would say if the, for the velocities V3 and V1 and V2, the relation will be V2 is greater than V1 greater than V3, okay? Which is this one, V2 is greater than V1 greater than V3. For this one, rank in order from largest to smallest, that's about Pascal. The magnitudes of forces F1, F2, F3 required for balancing the masses shown in the figure below. Note that the area A1 is less than the area A, less than the area A, and friction is negligible. So in this case, 
for any of the three uh, hydraulic devices. The pressure here, sorry, the pressure here equals the pressure in this point, equals the pressure in this point, equals the pressure in the other point. So you can say that 500 kilogram times G, that's the weight, divided by the area, this is the pressure, equals to the pressure on the other side, which is F1 divided by A1. And also for the second device, the pressure here equals the pressure on the other side, equals the pressure on the third side. So you can say that 600 kilogram times G, which is 9.8, which is the weight here, divided by the area A equals the force F2 divided by the area A1. Okay, and here also it's A1. And for the third device, the same issue, the pressure on both sides are equal. So 600 kilogram times G divided by area A equals the force F3 divided by A1. So if you, it's, it's easy to find that F2 divide F, this one is F3, sorry, F3 divided by A1 equals F2 divided by A1. So I would say F3 equals to F2 because the other side is the same. Okay. For the first one, how to compare the first one to the other two? They are 500 over A, 500 over A. The numerator here is lower than the numerator on the other side. So I expect the force F1 to be smaller than the force F2 or the force F3. So the force F1 is lower than F2 and F3. So I would choose the first one that F2 and F3 are equal and both are greater than the force F1. This one is for Pascal 2, mass A and B rest on very light piston that enclose a fluid as shown in this figure. There is no friction between the pistons and the cylinders, they fit inside. Which of the following is true? Before we look at uh, the choices, here we have piston, two sides. This is a large area and the other one is a smaller area. Okay. So expect the mass, if they are in balance, the mass MB to be greater than the mass MA. So here I would choose mass B is greater than the mass A because the area here is greater than the area on the other side. 